Good morning. Just give people a few minutes to sit, get to their, their seats. You all look great, by the way. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you so much for being here early this morning. And welcome to the 2017 Community Engagement Institute. Let's give yourself a round of applause just for being here <laughs> this morning. <clears throat> So my name is Dr. Shantice Allen, and I serve as the program director for UAB School of Public Health and Center for Clinical and Translational Sciences, One Great Community Project. I'm also an assistant professor in the School of Public Health in the Department of Human Environmental and in Environmental Health Sciences, excuse me. And I'm going to serve as your institute moderator for the day. So thank you all so much for being here this morning and taking the time to join us to be educated and informed by our talented guest speakers, breakout session presenters, those who will be participating as exhibitors for Cookies and Conversations this afternoon. And we hope that you really are empowered to use some of the strategies that you hear today and that you hear and learn today, and also to be encouraged and engaged through networking and dialogue with your peers. So this is going to be an incredible full day of activities, and I'm really pleased that you're here to share it with us. So the last few months have really been a whirlwind of meeting and planning this um, event, and we've come to this point today of the Institute. And so I'd really just like to recognize this year's organizing committee, those who have been involved with the planning and joining forces to lead and support the Institute. So if I can just get those who have been um, instrumental in helping to organize this event to please stand or just wave your hand <laughs> who you are. <laughs> And honestly, because of their volunteer leadership, we've been able to put together the fourth year of this event. So thank you all for your effort and your support. I also want to acknowledge the sponsors and supporters of the Community Engagement Institute, the Center for Clinical and Translational Sciences, One Great Community Project, and UAB's Center for the Study of Community Health, as well as UAB's School of Public Health and those will be scrolling on, on the screen. So now I'd like to ask my colleague, Dr. Max Michael, who's the Dean of the School of Public Health, to approach the stage to bring greetings from the school. And please join me in welcoming Dr. Michael. <laughs> Good morning. So ideas are really easy to come up with, right? Um, the idea for the Community Engagement Institute came up obviously four or five years ago through some meetings with uh, uh, community advisors from a couple of organizations. We are here because of Shantice. Um, Shantice um, took an idea and her energy, creativity, innovation, all those kinds of things has made this happen. And I want everybody please to recognize Shantice. You're terrific. So it's my uh, deep honor and pleasure to introduce the first keynote speaker who is a colleague, a friend, and a mentor. And it's just been terrific uh, through one great community and the Center for Clinical and Translational Science the last couple of years to reconnect with uh, Dr. Crook uh, over the last couple of years uh, and seeing the work that he does. Uh, Dr. Crook is the director of the Center for Healthy Communities uh, at the University of South Alabama and also the um, Abraham Mitchell Professor and Chair of the Department of Internal Medicine. Um, Errol comes to us uh, by way of Monroeville, uh, where he grew up, he went to Yale as an undergraduate and then the Columbia Medical School. Then we were fortunate he came back to UAB where he trained in internal medicine and nephrology. Uh, after that, he went to the University of Mississippi Medical Center where he's on the faculty for a couple of years 
uh, then traveled up to Wayne State School of Medicine in Detroit, where he's on the faculty for a number of years, served as the acting chair of the Department of Internal Medicine for a couple of years before coming uh, to South Alabama to serve in the current role as uh, chief of medicine. <clears throat> Errol has done an incredible job there, attracting a large number of grants around the areas of his interests, which are hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, uh, and health disparities. So it is truly a pleasure to introduce Dr. Crook to you. Um, I think you will, I know you will enjoy his comments. It is truly an honor to have him here. Errol, thanks for being here. And he dressed up. <laughs> thanks, Dr. Michael and Dr. Allen, and congratulations to you all and your success in this event over the years. As I told uh, Max, I can not have said doctor once, I can call him Max, uh, that when he and I both have on ties, I guess it's an important day. <laughs> um, it's really an honor for me to be here. It's been an honor for me to have the opportunity to, to work with uh, Dr. Allen, Dr. Michael, and their teams over the last uh, several years in doing collaborative work and trying to move uh, the health of this state and region forward. Um, this type of work is difficult, it's tough, and it requires uh, very strong teams in place. And I want to acknowledge now uh, my team back in Mobile who are hopefully hearing me and maybe seeing, seeing me via live stream. Uh, I told them I'd give them a shout out and I'm, I'm gonna give them more during the talk. And uh, we are truly blessed that uh, at least South Alabama and UAB in, these, in this situation particularly have been able to be, to be partners. So um, you notice the uh, title there, Community and Academics at the Altar. Uh, so the meaning, take it how, however you want to take it. Marriage, that's one way you go to the altar. In prayer together, that's another way you go to the altar. We, I think we need all of those things in order to make sure we go forward. I'm ho and what I'm going to do today is hopefully be more provocative and induce conversation and ideas and generation of ideas than I am about you know, trying to prescribe something. Because what I've learned is that you cannot prescribe how this works. Um, Tip O'Neill, uh, there's a lot of younger people in here who don't know who Tip O'Neill is, but he was the Speaker of the House of Representatives from Massachusetts. He was there for a long time, he actually became quite an icon. He's iconic enough that he used to make uh, cameos on the television show Cheers. You guys can catch that now on late night TV. Uh, but his, his statement was, all politics is local. And when you want to talk about community engagement and really focusing on healthcare, almost all of that is really local. There can be a national framework, but the real progress is, is really local. So bring your greetings from Mobile. Uh, if you don't know, uh, one fact I will bring is that we are the birthplace of Mardi Gras. It's not New Orleans. We are a family-friendly version. We, uh, you can uh, not have your nose and olfactory senses uh, offended by the smell of uh, things you may not ought to smell. And things that ought not be bared in public aren't bared for you to get things thrown to you. So our characteristic throw in Mobile, uh, which belies maybe some of our issues in the state, is the moon pie. You know, that great delicacy that's uh, between cookies with sort of this marshmallow uh, filling. If any of you guys are like moon pies, if you come to Mobile around the Fat Tuesday weekend, you can uh, get a year supply. Uh, I'm told they freeze well. And I'm also told that if you microwave them with a little ice cream on top, that'd be pretty good. If you're interested in uh, hearing, uh, learning about new flavors, come around that time, that's when they are tested and you can give your feedback to the, to the uh, company. So <clears throat> just uh, a bit about who I am and talk a bit about my journey to where I am. So you've heard about uh, uh, from where I'm, that I am an Alabamian 
in small town of Monroeville in southwest Alabama, and we call Lower Alabama. It's the home of Harper Lee, who wrote To Kill a Markenberg. That's how we're known. Um, things have changed a bit in the last 50 or 60 years uh, from, from that book a bit. Uh, but I'm, I'm also a Northern Alabama product. <clears throat> Excuse me, my, my uh, mom grew up in Fairfield and I was able to find a wife. She's sitting out there now, able to attend a day here in, in, in uh, Birmingham, who actually is an alumnus of the med school here and, uh, and a native of this city and, and Bessemer, Alabama. Actually, Muscota, just to tell you just how much we know about this place. So, um, you know, I, I came about um, my career in, in academic medicine really as I was in medical school and just sort of watching role models and, and deciding that these people who were teaching me, and I was in New York City at the time, were people that I wanted to be like. And I think a large part of what uh, community engagement ultimately becomes is role modeling, that we have to role model to the academic side and the community side, the government side, NGO organizations, how things should be so that those who are coming after will have an opportunity to understand the paths they ought to take. But one of the things that sort of pushed me in that, in that regard was I saw the influence that my teachers had on how attitudes and approaches to patient care were shaped. And it became clear to me that there were certain factors that may have not been understood in, in, in persons' lives. And it was important that you had people who could have some form of um, connection, if you will, with their patients and their uh, clients in order to be able to really make those uh, relationships as strong as possible. So I convinced myself that that's what I wanted to be. But the path to get there at uh, my stage of the game was really set that you needed to be purely academic and investigator. That was the way you need to go do things. And in order to be that, you need to be a basic science investigator. And that's actually a, a significantly different from where we are now, where in fact the science of community engagement, health disparities, and things that we'll uh, chat about as we go through, is really this burgeoning science that you ultimately, in many cases, need to start if you're on the, going down the academic path, and if you're gonna be actually on the, uh, on the business side of those things, you need to start those paths early in your life because the specificity with which that is required to be successful has increased. It's an exciting time now because we have this burgeoning science and community engagement. Uh, events like this allow that science to, to, grow, to, uh, to uh, grow. So I'm also an administrator. I get to advise university and health system and college of medicine and other leadership, which is also a wonderful thing. And I've been the principal investigator, as you mentioned, from our um, uh, actually, a multitude of, of studies, and most re most recently, over the course of my time at South Alabama, really focus around health disparities. So, I just want to let you know where Monroe is. I'm proud of my little town, and Mobile, and the Gulf Coast. One of the things about us down in Mobile is that we really take more of a, a regional approach to things. You know, you have these couple little uh, cutouts here. Let me see if my I don't know if my, uh, yeah, it does, right. They have the, uh, we have these uh, little cutouts down here for Alabama and Mississippi to have a coastline and Florida and Louisiana get most of it. But so we take along the Gulf Coast a real kind of a regional approach to how we do things because the culture kind of spreads uh, horizontally, if you will, looking at the map across the Gulf Coast. Uh, as much as it does vertically within, within the state. So I put this crooked slide in here, and the reason I put it in here for a reason, one to belie my age and what I was doing, and what, what, where we've come. So as I told you, part of what the pathway that I had to take was one about being a basic scientist. And so a mentor of mine, uh, uh, 
started me down that pathway in understanding molecular mechanisms behind diabetes. And I'm not here to talk to you about what the, this slide means. It's basically a slide that demonstrates insulin resistance, which is a cornerstone behind type 2 diabetes, but this was done in cells. And it was actually done while I was a resident here at uh, UAB in internal medicine with uh, a mentor of mine. It was the first uh, uh, slide and the first scientific paper that I, I published. But down the road as things went on, I had the opportunity to evolve, I'm going to use that word evolve, to uh, expand my horizons, particularly in the health disparities research. And before I get into this definition, I'm going to tell you a quick story about how I got there. Um, I was at the University of Mississippi, and we had the opportunity to start something there called the Jackson Heart Study. <clears throat> so the Jackson Heart Study is a prospective observational trial that is exploring why African Americans have excess rates of cardiovascular disease and die at higher rates. Now, this was actually, when, when this decision was made to have this start back in the early 90s, this was actually a, a fairly novel finding. And it was surprising to, to say that that was a novel finding because there was data to suggest that, particularly in the rural South, African Americans may have actually been protected from heart disease. And some of that was because of we exercised more, we had healthier diets compared to where we uh, do now. And when I say protected, I meant relative to uh, Southern white Americans, okay? Now we've all made progress, but that, that flipped in a few decades. And I think as we go through the understanding why that flip occurred is in large part why we have to be very involved in, in this kind of work. But, so that study was going to bring in people from the Tri-County area in central Mississippi around Jackson, Mississippi, Alabama, African Americans, bring them in, do lots of studies on them, actually give them that data back and then follow them over time, examine them every three to five years and see who got heart disease, who got kidney disease, who had a stroke, et cetera. The, what's called a prospective observational trial, so observing them going forward. And the, the community engagement piece of that uh, I have the opportunity to uh, sit on the committee, and the community engagement was, first was a good, part of it was really good, and this is just a standard at the time, was we're going to have a community, a community advisory board. We're going to identify some community leaders, not necessarily those that are the standard community leaders, and bring them in and get them on board with this. They're going to go out and spread the word. We're going to put up billboards. We're going to run radio ads. We might run some television ads. So when then your name comes up at random, when we go through the uh, voter registration, phone book, and driver's license rolls, and someone comes and knocks on your door and says, hi, congratulations, not, not that you've won the publisher's clearinghouse uh, sweepstakes, you've been selected to participate in the Jackson Heart Study. When that happens, you're going to jump up and down and say yes. And we quickly learned a lesson that that wasn't enough. Well, I, uh, okay, and and the community advisory group gave them uh, told from the beginning that that wasn't going to work. That um, having this media blitz, at, which was you know different than the kind of media blitz you can have today, was not a work. That you really had to build trust and that you had to put more effort into it than that. But that was the standard at the time. And I'm, I'm happy to say that over this now 20 plus year period of time that we've come uh, incredibly far. And in fact, that we've coined terms such as health disparities researchers uh, and have started to formalize uh, that pro profession, if you will. And I do see it as a profession. So up here, what you've had opportunity to look at is the definition of health disparities if you were to take it from NIH or CDC Marion Webster or Wikipedia sites, okay? Basically, there are differences in how certain groups do compared to other groups with regards to their health, how often they may get a disease, the severity of the disease, the impact that disease may have on that population, including death. But I learned, uh, I, I like to use this as an illustration as to how the public sees health disparity. So years ago, I'm a kidney specialist, I'm a nephrologist, and I had a 
young niece at the time. She, she was a bright young woman, and I was trying to push her to become a physician, doing my job as an uncle. And I took her and let her see what I was doing one day, and she went into a dialysis unit, and I walked out, and I was just talking about how exciting it is that we have this technology that you can do dialysis on people. Don't you find this interesting? And it went on and on, and this is the comment I got. Why are only black people on dialysis? So she, at age 13, saw the disparity. And it wasn't unique to which dialysis unit I took her into. When you go into in the southeastern United States, this is the picture you're going to see, OK? Even when you're in a community where the number of African Americans is incredibly low, you're still going to notice that almost all the people in there are African American. And that's an observation that comes from the community. And as I'm going to be a recurrent theme here is, the community are the eyes, ears, and squeaky wheels for all of us on the academic side and policy side of this. And we are, our job is to give them that voice so that their, the, sight, the, the observations they are making, the things they are hearing, the things they are smelling and seeing can be appropriately articulated and can be acted upon. So, one of the differences in health disparities research than, say, basic science research in that graph plot I showed you is that health disparities research, I've learned, is oftentimes better depicted in a story than with a graph, a plot, or a table. Now, we on the academic side, in order to get grants and to get the money to be able to do these partnerships, have to somehow distill that information down into a graph, a plot, or a table. But it's really difficult to tell the story through that. And so the story, the visual stories, are very important. And it's our job as partners to really try to uh, capture those stories. And the other piece is, while say maybe more quote unquote traditional research methods, methodology, we really want to focus not as much on the method sometimes as much on the result. But really, in health disparities work, it's actually the process. It's the process, okay? And the result, whether it's good or bad. If you have an intervention, I was talking to folks out there, there are posters who have some planned interventions, some who've had interventions. If you have an intervention and you may not get what you expect to get, all right, quote unquote, I got a bad result, okay? It's not bad. There's a lesson to be learned from that. Why did it not, why did you not get what you got, what you wanted to get? The process and why you got to where you got, uh, where you ended up is very, very important and perhaps the most important part of that uh, work. <clears throat> so that is my introductory comments. <laughs> We're going to go on and talk about these things, which I've already hit on. And we're going to talk a bit about health versus health care and the social ter determinants of health. I probably won't talk as much about poverty as I originally intended to. And then in, talk in talking about this engagement process and how we're going to use that to achieve health equity. So I'm going to start off with a, a case. I'm an internist and doctor, and we, we do cases. So I have a man in his 80s in good health. He grew up in the rural south on a farm. He still co-owns and works the far family farm with his brother, raising a small herd of beef cattle. He still goes to his childhood Baptist church and has served as a deacon for over 50 years. He went to college, became a teacher of agriculture, worked as a vocational agriculture teacher and supervisor of such teachers for over 30 years. He doesn't smoke, drink, or cuss. I put in parentheses curse because I've used this slide in the northern part of the country before and I didn't even know what <laughs> cuss meant. He's been married over 60 years and lives independently with his wife, who's also a retired teacher, and his kids went to college, as have his grandkids. So, who is this man? My wife can't answer because she knows who I'm describing right here. But all of us ought to have a person like that that we can relate to parent, a grandparent, an uncle, okay, flip the gender, a mom, a grandmom, an aunt, okay? And we all should have that uh, mental image of who this, who this person is. <clears throat> and I've used this slide in talks around the country, okay? 
So didn't talk about ethnicity. Um, we don't know if this person is native born or an immigrant. Who you are and what your background is is really going to be a, how you're going to perceive this person. Okay. Haven't talked at all about their political persuasion. Okay. And one of the things I want you to ask yourself is that does the answer to any of these uh, questions or the ignorance of this information about this person's life make a difference in how he or his family would have received their health care or in their health status? Okay? Ask yourself that question. So if you were a health care provider and this person were in the bed, sheets up to their chin, and all you saw was the face and you, and you had this story, would it make a difference if you, any of these questions were answered? And I think we all know the answer to that is, is yes. Even though we have a person who is educated, has resources, has built some wealth, is, uh, and delivered that on to uh, subsequent generations, but the answer to those questions, that question is clearly yes. Okay? Do you feel that this person, as such described, was empowered to be healthy throughout his life? Okay, I think based upon some of the things we talked about, educated, has wealth, has passed it on, that regardless of how you answer those other questions, immigrant, native born, ethnicity, et cetera, this person probably is empowered, okay? And that's important in that we can't lay labels across broad swaths of people based upon whether they're African American, Hispanic, or not, whether or not they're immigrant or not, and that members within those communities are actually very empowered to do things for themselves and their community, understanding then that there are significant resources there. Okay, and this, you know, why, why not, we'll get to later, this more of a provocative question that I hope we can deal with in the question and answer session. So this is a slide that uh, I've used a lot over the years that tells us that a determinant of health, now this is not a determinant of health care, a determinant of health is really largely based upon your behaviors and, uh, and genetic predisposition and your social circumstance and environmental exposures. And health care, if you will, may get a tenth of that. In some populations, perhaps less of that. So your, the health of uh, a community, the health of an individual, is based on things that don't happen when they are seeing their nurse practitioner, their physician assistant, their dentist, or their physician. And in many cases, the debate about health in this country is about health care and access to it. And this, I'm not minimizing that at all. That's incredibly important. But the real debate and the real things that happens with community engagement focuses on that other 90% out there, okay? And that particularly that behavior and patterns of behavior, those social determinants and those environmental exposures, particularly those pieces. That's what uh, community engagement uh, does a wonderful job with, okay? So if we look at the social determinants of health as uh, they are defined by the WHO, uh, World Health Organization, is conditions in which people are born, grow, and work, live, and age, and the wider set of forces and systems shaping the conditions of their, of da of their daily life. Uh, in other words, in what international code, area code, zip code, and our census tract were you born, raised, and have lived a significant time now and in the past? A large part will determine about who you are with regards to your health. It's basically where you have been, what environment you have been in, both physically, physical environment in particular, but also environment from the greater sense, if you will. So uh, I have a list of things here from um, my Martin Wilkinson's work that of those things that are social determinants in health. And I'll, I like to draw the attention to the one on the, on the top, the opportunity to participate in society, okay? 
the opportunity to participate in society. That's one that's maybe not quite as um, specific as whether you're employed or not, whether or not you live in poverty, whether or not you have a good income or not. But the opportunity to participate in society is really that biggest social determinant of health. And all those other things below it, quite frankly, influence your opportunity. Now, there's a statement out there among many of our uh, sort of social scientists, if you will, social uh, sociologists, psychologists, but particularly sociologists, and economists of poor but not impoverished, right? And that you, by certain standards, may not be wealthy, but in your own environment, you have that opportunity to participate in society. You have an opportunity to advocate for yourself. So you are not impoverished. And what we're looking to do in, in, with community engagement is to have those who may be poor in some respects, either because of education or income or some other way, but they are not impoverished, that they have the opportunity to fully participate in society and advocate for themselves and their community. <clears throat> so I have had the uh, great honor of being a fellow of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation through their Harold Amos uh, program. Uh, and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation did done a wonderful thing in taking fellows from all the programs they had over the years and bringing them into a, a great community. Um, and time to time, survey them. So a few years ago, they made, uh, were doing surveys on the social determinants of health and asked the community which of these areas, uh, which of these social determinants had the greatest impact on, on health. And here are the results. And you can see that education won out overall. It was a landslide. Okay, got a majority basically. Income was second, but you notice that most of those other things, your income, your housing, employment, the safety of the community, actually all impact each other, but they particularly impact education and the opportunity to get the education that everyone deserves. So, um, when you, so for someone to have good health, for some, a community to, have to be healthy does not necessarily then depend upon the nurse, the doctor, the dentist, the nurse practitioner, the pharmacist, the medical social worker, the, the dietitian, the hospital administrator. It more, more heavily depends upon the mayor, the board of education, the county commission, the city council, the governor, the president, the Congress, et cetera, okay? That's where the, the ultimate uh, determinants of how healthy a community will, will come from. So in all of these, we have decisions that we have to make as individuals, we have decisions we have to make as groups, we have decisions we have to make as communities. And so here is one of those questions is, are all Americans empowered to make decisions that will ensure good health over their lifetime. I put that question up there because what you hear now, and, in, and really over the last decade, there has been probably more debate about health, and particularly health care in this country than I remember. There was probably a good bit of debate 52 years ago when Medicare started and got started, but it was a short-lived debate and they got it started. <clears throat> but with the uh, ultimate evolution to adoption of the Affordable Care Act, and then everything that's happened since that time, we've had more debate about health care than, than uh, I think I've, I've clearly seen in my time. And it's a good thing that we're having that debate. And in that debate, you very often hear about personal responsibility, and it's a personal choice that ultimately impacts a person's health. Here, uh, therefore, that's why I phrased the question this way, is that is everybody actually empowered to make a decision, make decisions on a daily basis that ultimately will impact their health in a positive way, okay? And that's, that's debatable, that's debatable. 
So what we've been chatting about here over the course of now, quite frankly, about 100 years is health care being either a right or privilege, okay? So we've made some decisions as a country that education is a right. So we try to make it available for everybody. Now you can debate about the quality of that across the board, but the system is there. Now there are people uh, doing things to try to adjust it, and it ought to be. But we haven't made this decision uh, in this country regarding health care. And that's ultimately what the real debate needs to be. And when that decision is made, actually a lot of other parts would be taken care of. But that's about health care, okay? And health care in many respects now, particularly for those who are not empowered to make their own decisions, it's about giving health care to someone who has gone pretty far down the road with, their, with an illness that has gotten to a point they have to seek out care, as opposed to the prevention that is much more, much more effective and necessary. So what we're talking about here now is really the health of a community versus health care as a asset to that community. And what we, I think, need to focus much more on is the uh, is health care, is, I'm sorry, is health, even more so than we focus on health care, okay? And as I said, those determinants of health are things that don't necessarily happen uh, at the health care provider's office. So if you have better access to health care, though, like we, it is well known that's going to correlate with better health outcomes, okay? You get diseases diagnosed earlier, uh, both the acute diseases and chronic diseases when things can be dealt with and uh, hopefully cured. You're much more likely to get preventive care services if you have access to health care. And you're much more likely to get chronic disease management. And it's the chronic diseases which are really the driving force behind the expense in healthcare, which is whatever, which is the driving uh, topic, it seems, is how much this costs, not necessarily how much benefit we get from it. You, um, if you have health insurance, uh, you are much more likely to have access to healthcare. However, there is a paradox out there that hasn't been proven yet, uh, and that is, that if you look, we haven't necessarily shown that having health insurance improves mortality in a definitive sense. I feel strongly that it does, but if you want to take a scientific definitive sense of that, meaning that you have to have a randomized control perspective trial, I would hate to be in the control group, <laughs> right? But if you look at that, and Oregon actually looked at that for a bit, and it actually could not show a mortality benefit. Now these trials are, a fraud because you have to run these trials really over a whole lifetime of someone to be able to, to do this as opposed to say a five-year trial. But when a five-year trial versus insurance versus no insurance can start to show a trend toward in, uh, improved mortality, imagine the impact then of lack of insurance over a majority of someone's lifetime. And I think it's clear, okay? So I think there's little debate that the access to health insurance or health care financing of some sort allows for a better opportunity to pursue your rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those things that were put forth in the Declaration of Independence, right? And that if you are going to actually be able to be a citizen of this country and a participant in our society, those are your rights. And clearly to be healthy is important for you to be able to pursue those rights. So, have decisions, okay? Your ability to control how you participate in society and therefore where you fall on the social determinants of health scale, a term I just made up for today, greatly impacts your daily life decisions and your health, okay? So it's good to be in a position you can decide where you want to buy your house because you're going to be able to have a good school system, safe neighborhoods, your kids will be able to uh, 
go to school and not have problems and get the education they need and be off to a great start in life. It's wonderful to be, able to be in a position to make that kind of decision. And so um, it's where you are in that social determinant scale, if you will, will decide whether or not you are in that position to be able to make that type of decision versus some other decisions that we're going to talk about here. So I have a couple of scenarios. Scenario one, your daily decisions. Do I ride my bike or walk to school today? Should I have an apple or an orange for a snack? Should we walk over to the park to play or swim in our pool? As my daughters taught me quite a while ago, those are called first world problems. Second scenario, do I buy my medicines this month or do I buy food? The car won't start, how am I gonna to get to work or school or to the doctor? Is it safe for me to take a walk to the store today? Okay, and those are clearly uh, questions that are being asked in many of the neighborhoods around this country and many of the communities that are being served by people in this room are dealing with those in scenario two, okay? We would love to be able for them to have the kind of decisions to make in scenario one. And in fact, we sometimes point an accusatory finger at those folks in the communities and, and living in scenario two about their food choices, okay? So it's really though, we would love to be able to get the apple and the orange to the community first, right? We need to be able to get the apple and the orange to the community first. We need to get them a safe playground first. So that, to then, then we can then criticize the choices someone makes when they actually have a choice to make, okay? And so in scenario one, yes, your choices about what you do really can Im impact your health. And yes, there's that place there that you know, if, if you ate more strips of bacon this morning, maybe you ought to, like I did. Okay, that's your choice. <laughs> okay? But in scenario two, if all you can get are potato chips and uh, dr sweetened drinks and liquor and cigarettes, and there's nothing else close by, you don't really have a choice, right? So our, our goal here is community engagement is to have the choices in scenario one be universal. Now that doesn't mean that everybody is a millionaire. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about having those opportunities to make those per wonderful, healthy choices in every community in our areas. So, I want you to just take some time here. I want you to describe a healthy, healthy community. I'm not going to call on anyone, but someone could. But I would like for someone to shout it out something to me. It's a, a characteristic of a healthy community. Loving. Say again. Loving. loving. If you have loving members of a community, then that's a healthy community. Great term. Who else? Clean. Clean. Being a clean community is a healthy community. High a high employment rate. Clearly, I think we all agree. Safe. Safe. <laughs> Having access to food, a grocery store. Yes, sir. Interconnected. Interconnected. You guys are doing great. Maybe we should be all policymakers. <laughs> Any other things? Engaged communities, good schools, multi-generational, multi wonderful. You guys know the solutions already. I knew you would. All right. So here are the things you said. I just call me call me Karnak the Magnificent. <laughs> right. Walkable, easily navigated safe, with good jobs, good educational opportunities, healthy and trusting relationship with neighbors, that interconnectedness and loving, access to all the necessities of life are nearby, low stress, right? I don't necessarily know what it is, but I know it when I see it kind of thing, right? <laughs> no exposure to environmental toxins, and you're able to make decisions regarding your community's destiny, right? The fact that you guys came up with that in 30 seconds, it took me 
30 minutes to come up with all of this maybe, and, uh, actually several years to come up with this. The prescription is not a hard prescription to get there. And the amount of money in a community does not uh, determine whether or not you have this. It, may, it goes a long way if you have a lot of money. But I can tell you there are a lot of communities with a lot of money that are not connected at all. You know, don't even know their neighbors, right? Their communities, those folks' communities are much more broadly defined, if you will. When you want to talk about loving and trusting communities, sometimes you go into some of the more uh, poor communities. Remember, I didn't use the word impoverished. I used the word poor by financial standards, if you will, because they don't meet thresholds for average uh, household income. But there are some of the most interconnected and trusting communities you can have. They have a lot of power there. And they need, we as community academic partnerships now have the opportunity to build upon that power and to get them to make sure they have all of those things. So, some of the other social determinants of health out there, individual and community empowerment, you know, the power to say yes. You know, the comfort in uh, not denying oneself things of value in order to avoid humiliation, okay? That's, that's important, right? Self-equity and mastery. You know, being educated uh, to the extent that you can advocate for the improvements and the opportunity to share your knowledge with others in need. And that's what our... Center for Health Communities, uh, community health advocates do for us, and we'll talk a bit more about them later. And then you, link, you can link health to other important factors in an individual or community's day-to-day -day life. So it may be faith-based approaches to improvements in community health. You know, we have lots of other organizations in our communities that are able to do that, right? So people go to church. They eat at church. So let's eat healthy, let's be loving, let's be supportive. Those kind, of, those kind of things are the kind of things we're talking about there. So one of the great challenges, and I've learned now over the years of being in a position of leadership, is that you, you use the word opportunity when you have a challenge. Uh, for the academic community partnership is for us to determine how we give greater voice to communities whose voices are ignored or voices who are diminished. That's our greater challenge. And over the next few minutes, as I wind up here, I give a few examples of some things we've done over our years in Mobile at the Center for Health Communities to start trying to do this. So one is to use a project called Photo Voice. And this is where, remember the days when you had disposable cameras? You know, everybody has a phone with the camera now. So you give them the camera and you send them out and say, bring us sort of a photo story that talks about the health in your community. So it's their photo journal, if you will. And we, we did this with senior citizens, and then we did it with high school students. And interestingly enough, the stories were the same. And you see some of the depictions here now, right? This is what people, when they want to talk about health in their community, you see these pictures and a couple here. So it's those vacant houses. So why is a vacant house an issue? Well, it becomes dilapidated. There are unsavory things that start to happen in those homes in some of these communities. Those communities are not felt to be safe because of that. You know, cleanliness, things you talked about, unkempt lots, the abandoned vehicles or, you know, down in our part of the world is a great place for varmints to live. And just having streets that are impassable sometimes. That's, and it, and it was multi-generational, as you mentioned, is one of those things as a, important for a community in that high school children and senior citizens saw the same thing. And so one thing we could do then is to link those two uh, age groups together uh, to get strength in numbers, and we will been able to do some of that. We have another way of doing this, and we do it through what we call a Community Health Advocates Program. Our director, Dr. Roma Hanks, has run this program for us now for over a decade. She's also the chair of sociology and anthropology at University of South Alabama. So we come up, came up with this idea of really having these volunteers, if you will, who would come from our communities of interest around us to 
be, who are committed to improving the health of their communities. And over the years, what we've done is we've allowed these people to really set the agenda for the Center for Healthy Communities. And we've do it, done it through a variety of ways. They decided the areas they want to focus on. I don't think these will be um, surprising areas of cardiovascular disease, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, the diet, nutrition, and physical activity issues and their consequences. We've been able over the years to empower them, if you will, by allowing them to uh, do what we call community health advocate directed projects. In many ways, a, a smaller version of one great community. It's amazing once we, once we, the two of us got together, uh, UAB and our Center of Health Communities got together, we realized we were doing a lot of the same things and, and with, some, with some various tweaks. And so they get to choose their areas. We uh, have them actually write a mini grant to us to ask for a budget and what they want to do and how they're going to monitor their progress on that. So we're building a skill set that allows, that allows them to move forward with that and hopefully um, be sustainable. Um, when we started this off, uh, I guess we were having these discussions back in 2006 and 2007, we talked about having this army of people, if you will, on a high level strike force. And we, we were probably a lot more optimistic uh, than what was realistic back then. But quite frankly, I think when you're doing this kind of work and particularly when you're building these academic community partnerships, you need to start off being very, very optimistic because realism comes fast enough. So if you don't shoot high enough, you won't get anywhere. And the idea was this army is that we were going to bring in uh, these folks who live in these communities that we are advocating for and be able to, to empower them with skill sets to advocate for their health, their family's health, in wherever place they thought would be the best. And that might be at home around their kitchen table, at their workplace, at a park bench, et cetera. Well, you know, lo and behold, you find that those people have a lot of challenges just getting through day-to-day -day life. And to come in and do things, even though they're, they're good things and volunteer, on a volunteer basis, is a challenge to them. Uh, but we were lucky in this situation that we were able to have, right now, probably around 10 to 12 folks, around 10 to 12 uh, community health advocates who stayed with us for all of this time voluntarily, okay? Now, the difference for them is that they were folks who actually were empowered to make their own choices. Many of them were folks who were, who went, did not necessarily live in those communities still, but they were still impassioned about them and went back and served in them, had family in them, and there are still those there who actually do live in them. And we've, over the uh, years, Dr. Hanks and her assistants have tried to understand what made them, what uh, built that resilience, if you will, for them to remain committed to us. And, and here are some of those big themes, that spirituality and the community trust, the interconnectedness, loving of the community and trusting of the community, and their uh, want to um, make things better. Many of them actually have started the health ministries at their churches, and there are lots of churches in those communities, and so that health becomes an important part of the um, uh, faith-based community's uh, itinerary as they have moved forward. Their uh, self and collective efficacy, they've been they're proud of what they're doing and their ability to give something back to their community, and they have this desire to pass it along. As, as we've all matured together, they are working hard to find that next generation of community health advocates that are going to be there and do the work they've done over this last decade plus. And they've been actually very um, um, satisfied with the opportunity to have professional opportunities and networking opportunities. Over the years, we've had several of them come to this meeting in, in, uh, in particular. And to have this meeting and other meetings around the region and nationally and have them have their, their voice heard is immensely important. So when you form the partnership, let's make sure that you make, give them those, the things that they need in order to stay engaged uh, in the partnership. And looking forward, those things that have uh, been important, have been identified as being important by our community health advocates to their uh, moving forward is to being able to directly influence policy change and to be able to address the mental health issues that they perceive as very important. Uh, uh, extraordinary in their own communities. 
Um, I've so talked about that. I'm not going to skip this and go to this. <clears throat> so one of the other projects that we have, um, I've just chosen two or three here today to talk about, where we've engaged with the community, if you will, is this one. We call it a Sentinel Surveillance to Monitor Progress Towards Health Equity, and Dr. Moth Arata is the um, uh, principal investigator of that and also director of research for the Center of Health Communities. So the idea was actually multifold. But so from a, one of them was just was to look at developing and then implementing a, a surveillance system regarding information about health and health IQ, access to health care within our communities of interest, and that being a way for us to monitor that progress. There are lots of national databases out there that we use data from. They pop into a community here and there and get some data, and they pull it all together. But they don't necessarily get to the places where you might find the best data. So we are using what we call Sentinel sites, so those real places where people, people gather. And the way we figured this out, the way Dr. Arata figured this out by pulling together this community advisory group from the communities and getting where those signal sites are and then implementing these, these uh, uh, short surveys. And we do it with research apprentices, which I'm gonna talk about a bit in a second. So a signal site might be Mrs. Jones' backyard on the third Saturday of the month. Uh, for if you want to get men, you need to go to this junkyard. It's, it's called Pull and something. I forget the last name. But uh, you can go, you can get the part, get the carburetor for your car so you can get your car going again. You go there on Saturday morning, you'll find them. If you go on this particular time of the day at this particular gas station, this is where you'll find a lot of people. This park on this Saturday of the month has th this happening. This is where you'll find people. And, and th so we knew, those were our signal sites. And it was a group of people that were being surveyed that very often would avoid surveyors, okay? These are the people that the census tract people would have trouble finding in many cases. And we've been able to build relationships with them and they've given us wonderful, wonderful data that I'll let her share with you in future, future meetings. The, um, the community advisory group talked to us about how to approach the community you know, identified those key places, and they were a sounding board for the results and next steps and helped us to identify the research apprentices. In this case, we actually took folks who lived in those communities and trained them in research. You know, they went through the same certification process that a faculty or staff person would at an institution. They would, got their certification and were imp out in the field implementing the surveys came into the office, put the data in, and even started to help with um, analysis and help, and are still helping us to this day. And in fact, my group in Mobile today will be talking about how, they, how we go about most effectively doing some of this data dissemination in a way that is informative to the community and, and will give us feedback on how we should use it uh, for next steps. You know, this is expensive. We pay them. This is a job. Right? So this is a, a way for us to move money into the community, give them employment, give them, empower them to have a skill that hopefully allows them to be more employable as they go forward and to be also a health advocate within their, in their communities. So how do we achieve health equity? Right? We're going to have to enhance the academic and community partnership in all aspects, and research, program development, development of policy, and economic development. You know, these partnerships need to cover all these areas. Expertise comes from different places, but the most important piece is a willingness. One thing I can tell you from the academic side is that if folks who write grants, who do some science, if they see that it is a hot topic, they will change what they do to chase the money. Okay, because money keeps them, keeps survives, right? So remember after 9-11, there was this talk about bioterrorism and things of that nature. There were a lot of investigators who somehow found a way to make their research applicable to bioterrorism, right? So when your policymakers understand that you and your vote want, your, want dollars to go toward 
research and health equity toward economic development in these communities that are not as empowered, they will send money that way. And you will see the resources start to amass in line to go, go in that direction. So as I end, there's a question to ponder as we go into the question and answer session. So if you could imagine a nation that has achieved health equity, you know, if you had to describe that health status, what would it look like? I'll just say one thing, right? One statement you could say is that no matter your ethnicity, immigration status, level of education, that everybody would have the same uh, life expectancy. But that would be awesome as long as life expectancy didn't go down for everybody, right? So the equality is one of the things, but we want, to, we want the standard to remain high. And that's what I think health equity is all about and what our partnership should try to get there too. All right, um, so community, you guys are the eyes. You see things before everybody else. You're the ears. You hear it before other people. You're the squeaky wheel. You need to be even more of a squeaky wheel, and I think it's academics' jobs to help make that squeak louder. And the most important term here, though, in enhancing this academic community partnership is respect and, and all of its meanings. The word respect between both parties is most important to make this successful. So. I'd like to acknowledge all of my folks at the Center for Health and Communities over the years. We've been a team together now for a dozen plus years and still working at it. And uh, Dr. S. Martha Aron and Hanks and Shannon Shelley Trimway are, uh, and all of their teams are critical to what we do. And they make they basically do the work that I'm unable to do because of all the other things I have to do. Um, we have been. Um, Grateful for funding from the National Institutes for Minority Health and Health Disparities and our recognition as the Center of Excellence in Health Disparities. And we're hoping that we can continue that relationship with them. And I thank you for your attention and your input today. And I look forward to being able to have some conversation about this topic in the next few minutes. So thank you and have enjoyed your meeting. much, Dr. Crook, for those interesting comments on, you know, really how we engage communities. Thank you so much for sharing about what, what happened with the Jackson Heart Study and the evolution of how to do community engagement correctly, and this whole idea of the process being important and, and really putting emphasis on that. I think all of us can take away from that and go back into our own communities and think about what that process looks like um, for our own respective networks. But um, now what I want to do is just open up the floor to questions. We have um, been live streaming Dr. Crook's talk and been seeing some tweets coming from your colleagues in Mobile, so they are able to see and hear us. That's great. Um, but if anyone has a question, I don't see a mic on the floor, but if you'll just raise your hand, speak very loudly, um, and we'll allow a, a couple of minutes for Q&A. Sure. Dr. Michael. Er Errol, that was terrific. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Well, thanks. I'll uh, repeat the question for those out live streaming. So, Dr. Michael commented about those photos from the Photo Voice uh, project and the fact that you can see those same types of photos, issues raised in any community. And then raised a question about the, the greatest challenge. And we've asked ourselves that on multiple occasions. How do you take that utterance, if you will, so that, that, that photo, photograph is an utterance, that's their voice, and move it to action? And that's actually, in many cases, where our greatest challenge is. So understanding that there is a problem and then starting to understand some of the underpinnings of the problem, sometimes it's not the biggest challenge, as though it's sovereign it is. And 
Uh, I'm going to start my answer by saying that, first of all, we recognized how great that challenge was. And one of the things, we did a few things. So one is that you stand up in places like this, public venues, where you have folks who can do something about those things and talk about it. So it's dissemination of the work. Two is uh, actually reaching out directly to policymakers. So the city council people in those areas, but they already knew this, but sometimes they just needed more voice behind them so that they can uh, marshal and mobilize the resources they needed out of their coffers. Um, and then thirdly is a self-help self -help piece to this. And sometimes it's just a, 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 an ability to, once those problems have been identified by multiple groups, sometimes people are thinking, I mean, I'm, I'm the only one seeing this and bothered by it. And that's not the case. When you recognize that multiple people are bothered by it, then they can get together and do a lot of that, uh, uh, solutions to these problems themselves. In this situation, our staff and with uh, uh, people with uh, the Burial Women's Coalition, one of the, a big uh, advocacy group that we worked with, and other groups actually went out and had some community cleanup days over the years. And you know, every time I come to these kind of things, I get energized. And my people back in Mobile, I think we, we need to have another community cleanup day here. I'll try to show up. <laughs> Thanks. Other questions? Yes, sir. Blue shirt back there. Yeah, so the question is about our research apprenticeship program and having the certifications. So, yes, it was IRB certification, but we have a, actually, Dr. Ariada has a much grander idea. And we've actually started you know, chatting about that with our university administration over the last few years. And we've been talking about this now even at a regional level through a consortium uh, that Dr. Michael um, oversees. And that is, you know, when it comes to uh, employability, if you will, and uh, we've had this discussions with the people, uh, person who runs a, a, a office called Mobile Works down in Mobile, you have them all over the country, it's that sort of moving people to employment. Having certifications makes, gets those people the quote, documentation, unquote, of their skill sets that is necessary for them to move into uh, areas of employment, right? So it's in carpentry and uh, painting and welding, you know, things, you know, we, we build ships down in Mobile. So there's these levels of certification you can get it to the degree of a welder that says I can, that you can do these things once you hit this, re reach this certification, and that goes straight to uh, direct line to a job. You think through it from a research apprentice, you know, what certification can we give them and, and, and what does that mean to the community? And those are the things we're dealing with. So yes, we have the IRB certification that you, know, you have gone through training and completed it successfully that you understand the issues around human research. And that's, I can tell you that 90% of the people in our research apprenticeship program are, were not people that anyone would have predicted would have gone through that pathway, okay? Now, we also, though, are looking to see if we can move toward some broader certification. Is it something we can even do at the university level, some program, MATIC kind of thing, you know, not a diploma, but a certification that they can get that is meaningful talking about partnering with our community uh, college in, in the area of Bishop State to see if we can somehow formalize that in another way, but, also, but in a way that it me, moves to employment for them, to a career for them. So we, we've had the opportunity, Dr. Ariana and her group have had the opportunity to present at national meetings, and, and she takes, has taken research apprentices with them. 
they did one, one at one of the, the National Public Health meeting once in a panel discussion. And so when they were preparing for it, one of the discussions, one of the questions was, what's the difference between being a research apprentice and then being a staffer in our office, being an employer, full-time employer with us? Because we have moved people from research apprentice to research assistants in our office. And one of the persons who made that transition said, that's easy, is benefits. Okay, so uh, they, the others are employed, hourly wage, but now he's employed, a university employee, and now has the uh, access to the benefits. So health insurance, retirement benefits, et cetera. Okay, long-winded answer. I hope I gave you what you need. I see you were busily writing. That's why I kept talking. Right next to you. Yes, ma'am. But I see people that just are totally unaware of their body parts, of how things function together. Um, they know if they hurt, or they know if something doesn't work, they can't change their mood. But how much effort has been put in helping people just know about basic body functions and structure as a way of increasing? Okay, thank you for your question. Just sort of repeat it for those who are out there in the live stream world. The question is, has there been any um, efforts to see if sort of knowledge about anatomy and physiology, if you will, so how the body works and what parts are where and how if that might influence uh, health outcomes. So I, I guess in my answer to that, I can't answer that question specifically, that if we taught sort of a, a mini anatomy and physiology course to, to uh, uh, patients in the healthcare environment, if they would understand those things better. I can't, I can't talk about that specificity. I can talk about it more globally with regards to health literacy, if you will. And, and health literacy is a, is a big term, but clearly the more health literate a person is, the more empowered they are to uh, to take charge of their own health and to clearly participate as a full partner with the healthcare provider in their care. And so in health literacy, you know, it's, we haven't talked so much about understanding how the heart works at a cellular level or how the pancreas works at a cellular level, but what you do at a global level, and, um, and I think um, when those things have happened and you have a more health literate um, populace, we do have uh, data to show that those folks are, have better outcomes for many things. So cholesterol, uh, blood sugar control, blood pressure control, for example. Um, your question specifically is one that's, I think, interesting to ponder and uh, maybe put to the test. I, I, can't, I don't have a definitive answer. Someone else in the room might. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. You know, you talk about community engagement uh, and really think in the community, we think rural, metropolitan, and even further north. You have impoverished areas, have metropolitan areas, and then even further you say, we have excellent on uh, enclaves, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the the question is, um, and with with all the different sort of geographic scenarios we have, with in the metropolitan versus rural, the different enclaves you can have within a metropolitan environment, even even within a rural environment, can you sort of take a one size fits all approach? If you don't do that, how specific do you need to characterize the population? So I go back to my comment about, you know, sort of all politics is local, you know, all health care is local, actually all sort of health policy in many, not all health policy, but a lot of health policy and those things are local. So 
you know, clean air and clean water, those kind of things are universal, right? You shouldn't have lead in the pipes, uh, those kind of things. You know, those kind of things are universal. And, those, and vaccinations are, uh, are improved health outcomes, those kind of things are universal. Where it gets specific is, I'll take the vaccination effort, is how do you improve the vaccination rate in any community? And that's where it really gets to be specific. And, and it's a bias of mine, and I think um, it's not, I'm not the only one with this bias. I would say a majority of those people who would you know, sort of call themselves health uh, disparities investigators would say that you really need to understand that community. And that's where the partnership is important because you know, what works in Mobile may not work in Birmingham even, and what works in Alabama doesn't necessarily work in New York, and what works in New York doesn't work in parts of California. But they, but they might. So it gives you a framework to start from, and then you do tweaking to try to individualize it for your own community. So having the community partnership, at least there say, let me pass this by you. Let's talk about this. Do you think this will work? And then you get the feedback from them. So it's, it's really critical, and that's, that's why you really need that, like I quote air quotes here, that army of people out there that can give you that local information that you need in order to make it work. And when you look at, when you look at successful uh, programmatic uh, programs that have actually been successful in improving breastfeeding rates or improving vaccination rates or improving adherence to a medication, they almost always have been very local, with very strong ties with community partners that have basically given them the direction and the roadmap to go. Thank you for that question. All right, I guess we've been at church long enough. <laughs> we can leave the altar now. Thank you again for, all the, for your attention. I've got a little bit after 10 this morning. Um, so it's now time for us to transition out of this space outside into the pre-event area where the posters are for additional networking opportunity and time to talk um, and also to move into the breakout session of portion of our agenda. So outside of the ballroom, you're invited to continue to view those thought-provoking posters, talk with the presenters of that work, Feel free to make calls if you need to, interact with people that you've met this morning, exchange information, et cetera. There are three breakout sessions literally right directly across the hall from the room that we're in. Um, the rooms are labeled A, B, and C, and you should refer to your program agenda for more information on those sessions and which, ones you would, which one you would like to attend. Um, the sessions are one hour. They actually start at 11 o'clock, so we have a little bit of time um, in order to network, as I said, and to look at additional posters. The session presenters in those rooms will explain the structure of their actual presentation format once you've gotten settled in um, to those rooms. We really hope that Dr. Crook's um, opening remarks sparks discussion as you're thinking about community engagement and how that would look and work in your own in your own respective communities, and hopefully you can take some of those ideas that you, that's been shared this morning, as well as what you're here in the breakout sessions. Take those away and use those to really shape, plan, and implement your own ideas in your respective organizations and communities. We'll reconvene in this room at noon. Um, I have just gotten a text that um, Diane Bell McCoy is on the ground. She flew in this morning, so she's here. Um, and we have someone who is um, transporting her as I speak. But noon, we'll, re we'll reconvene back in the space after you've gotten your lunch, um, and we'll begin the afternoon portion of our agenda. Please continue to use the hashtag CEI2017 um, on our Twitter feed, which is at UABCEI. 
Um, as well as follow us on Facebook. We're on Facebook um, under Community Engagement Institute. Take pictures, post them, let people know where you are. We really do want social media to be used um, throughout the meeting today, so please take a moment to do that. Um, again, we've got a little bit of time to network. We also have some networking opportunity this afternoon, so don't leave. <laughs> Okay, if you can stay, don't leave early. Um, if you do have to leave after lunch, do make sure that you do your evaluation, which is in your packet before you leave. We want your feedback um, so that we'll know what to do, what to change, what you suggest so that we can implement that for 2018. Um, so with that being said, enjoy the time to actually kind of engage with each other and, inter and interact. Um, take a look at the posters that are out there 11 o'clock is when sessions began. Let's say about 1045, actually, so that we can have some time, really some good time for um, you all to be in those sessions with the presenters. And again, we'll meet back in this space at noon. Thank you, Dr. Crook, again, for being here. All right, see you then. <clears throat>